Hello, I'm Gordon Lang, editor of Cameralabs.com. I'm two weeks into my trip away from New Zealand and as you can see I've gone native. I'm at Erg Chebi in Morocco at the edge of the Sahara Desert, which is the ideal location if you want to embark on a camel trek or a quad bike tour of the sand dunes behind me. They look absolutely spectacular. It's about 5.30 p.m., which is exactly the time when the tours normally leave. So forgive me if there's the sound or indeed the sight of any passing camels or bikes or four-wheel drive vehicles. I actually went out on the camel trek last night into the desert and it was absolutely fantastic. I'm staying at a place called uh, Auberge du Sud and they've been really good at organising everything. So if you're looking for a great sand dune experience in Morocco, I can highly recommend them. Now what I'm doing here at the moment is just a normal vacation or holiday. I'm away from home for a couple of weeks and like most people who run an internet based business it's possible to you know update the business, keep on top of it while you're away. But what makes this different is that instead of going home after a couple of weeks I'm going to try and stay out for a bit longer. I'm here with my family and it's a good time for them to travel so we wanted to see if it was possible to stay out for longer. Maybe four weeks, maybe six weeks, maybe eight, maybe longer. It depends how well it works or, or doesn't work. Um, the idea is is that very shortly we'll get an apartment somewhere and, and I'll actually be able to settle down and do some proper work rather than just getting a, a little snatch in here and there. So I'm going to update you as to how that goes. The old working holiday, is it a nirvana or is it a nightmare? I'll, I'll soon find out. So in this video though, what I wanted to do was to tell you a little bit about Morocco but also update you on the, uh, on the equipment that I've, that I've brought with me and how it's working out so far two weeks into the trip. In terms of Morocco itself, I'm amazed it's taken me this long. There's <laughs> just a dung beetle just walked over my foot. It's pretty cool. These things are enormous. Um, there was no dung on it though. That would be terrible. It's that way, the dung. That way. Over there into the desert. It's huge. Anyway, Morocco is such a fantastic destination, especially if you're a photographer. There is so there are so many things to take pictures of, such enormous variety. I flew into Marrakesh where you've got all the busyness of the night markets and we're going to be flying out of Fez where you've got a similar sort of thing. So you've got these spectacular night markets, really busy, amazing little twisty streets uh, where you, you get very easily lost but also very easily found again. It really, just in itself, a fantastic place to visit. But then a few hours outside of, uh, outside of Marrakesh, you, you drive over the Atlas Mountains, which are, which are also spectacular. And a lot of people are a bit nervous about driving over mountains. We've spoken to quite a few people who, you know, hired guides. And if that's your sort of thing, that's fine. But we like to do things a bit more independently. And, and let me tell you, I've got a normal, I've just rented a normal two-wheel drive vehicle, nothing special at all. And I've got the family in there and we drove over the mountains, no problem. If you're used to, you know, little switchbacks and going up and down steep hills, absolutely fine. Likewise going into the desert, I mean I had to go off-road a little bit to get to this location over some sand but the, the vehicle could take it. It was a bit bit wobbly but you know no problem at all so it feels very safe here. It's extremely friendly, the people are great, the food's lovely. Um, as I say when you come over the Atlas Mountains there's, uh, there's lots of things to see. The first place we stopped off at was this amazing casbah. I think that's what you call it and at this point I should apologize for any of my pronunciations. Hopefully what I, I lack in, in correct pronunciation. I make up for enthusiasm about this place. So there's this, uh, this, this amazing set of buildings called um, Ben Hadou. And it's been used as a, a movie location for so many things. Young Indiana Jones, um, Gladiator, uh, almost any, any kind of biblical epic you can, you can mention. And just when you walk in there, it's like you've been transported back 2,000 years. It's absolutely fantastic. I mean, extremely touristy, but you know sometimes that's why places are touristy because they are that spectacular i'd highly recommend that um then a few hours drive from there there are two absolutely gorgeous gorges there's the gorge uh dada dades 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 again apologies for the pronunciation and after that the uh, gorge todra both absolutely beautiful but but about 20 minutes into the gorge todra was this amazing auberge this place to stay called Auberge Le Festival and if you're looking for a place to stay in the uh, in, in either of those gorges I can really recommend this place it's like a castle in the middle of nowhere I mean there's no wi-fi and there's only a small amount of electricity as well but it's just so spectacularly beautiful and it's one of those places where you look at it it's like a, a proper castle and you think wow this place is going to be really expensive but it's nice it's, it's actually pretty good value and the scenery there is spectacular and then from there we drove on to uh, towards the dunes which is where I am now. And again, I did this camel tour last night. 
to some uh, tents, stayed overnight in the desert, which again was an absolutely fabulous experience. So Morocco, if you've not visited, come right now, it's brilliant. Now onto the equipment, which is probably why you're watching this anyway. Do you really want to hear travel advice from me or tips? Let me know in the comments, you know, I, I love doing this sort of thing. So if you like it, that's great. I should say I've also got an audience, a little bird is watching me right now and there's a good chance it could poo on my camera so if the picture suddenly goes a bit nasty, you know why. Speaking of the picture, I'm actually filming this with an iPad which I've been really impressed with. I mean the iPad has become, for us, the ultimate travel accessory. I mean you can do so much with it, entertain the kids with tons of videos, you obviously go on the internet, check your email, mapping is, is invaluable with it. Um, but it's also a really good camera. I'm filming this with the latest one, the iPad 3 HD, or whatever you want to call it, the new iPad. And I'm really impressed with the quality. Again, tell me what you think. I, I'm, I'm, I think this is all right. The reason I'm filming uh, with it is because I've only got one other camera. And if you saw the first uh, video that I made on my trip from San Francisco, you'll know that I've taken away a Panasonic GX1. And here it is. The reason I've gone for this camera is, is purely on, well, predominantly on size and weight because this thing is just so small and yet offers such great flexibility. As you know, I'm a great fan of uh, mirrorless compact system cameras, things like Micro Four Thirds models from Panasonic and Olympus, Sony NEX, the Samsung NX. There's quite a few of them now, Nikon One. I, I, I really like them because they offer most of the quality and control that you want from a DSLR, but in a much smaller, more portable package. And portability has been really important for me on this trip because I hate carrying big bags around. I want to travel really light. And in fact, pretty much everything I've got, he says reaching down here, is in this single rucksack. And I wanted to keep the weight down as well. And in fact, fully loaded with my computer, tablet, camera, lenses, clothes, even a bottle of water. I've got this down to just over six kilograms, which meets carry-on regulations. Now, as probably quite a few of you are photographers who have traveled, you'll know that a lot of us um, slightly push the boundaries on, uh, on weight in terms of uh, airlines and you know it's not uncommon for a photographer who's got a lot of equipment to carry on maybe 20 kilograms or at least 15 but I've really actually done it properly this time I'm, I'm fully above board I'm, I'm only carrying just over six kilograms so it's all good and the important thing here is that if I was just after pure image quality then I would have gone away with a camera like the Nikon D800 or the Canon 5D Mark II. Couple one of those with a you know a couple of really nice lenses, an ultra wide, uh, maybe a telephoto, or a general purpose, and you will take some absolutely gorgeous photos. I mean, they will look fantastic. But equally, it will weigh several kilograms and it will fill the best part of this bag. And I didn't want to do that, so I've gone for a smaller model. Now, as I said in the first part of uh, my video. I really like the Sony NEX models at the moment. The 5N I think represents superb value. The NEX7 is, is also really, really good. But the trouble with that system is that it's still quite immature and there's not a great deal of lenses. And on a trip like this, for me, it's all about the lenses. A lot of people choose cameras based on the features of, of, of a body, but really you should be looking at lenses and, and whether the optics are there that you want. And this is why I chose Micro Four Thirds because it is that bit more established and there are that more lenses available. Indeed, there's, there's quite a few choices. So here's how, it worked. here's how it's worked out. I've taken the GX1 because it's very small, it's light, it's got a touch screen and I'm really getting into focusing with those. And I've come away with four lenses. There's the 14 to 42 millimeter power zoom here, which is just fantastic for a kind of small portable camera. And this is uh, one of only two image stabilized lenses I've got. And it's really great for, for kind of discrete shooting, or this is what I used when I was on the camel because I couldn't exactly change lenses while I was on there. You've got to really hold on to that thing. So this is a good general purpose lens. I'm also using this a lot for video. But the other lenses that I brought with me are here. And I've got them all in the top, top pouch of this bag, which was, which was really important for me. Now, this is my general purpose lens uh, for decent quality. This is uh, a Leica 25mm f1.4 and everything in the Micro Four Thirds standard is multiplied by 2 so this effectively becomes 50mm, again still f1.4 and that means that it's great for portraits and just general purpose use. This is a very high quality lens. For me there was no other, no other choice for this. 
Actually, I lie, there was another choice. There was the Panasonic 20mm f1.7. And that's also a really good lens, and it's smaller. It's sort of roughly the same size as this. They call it a Pancake Prime. But I wanted the extra quality of the Leica and the slightly brighter aperture. That's why I went for that model. This is one of the more interesting lenses uh, for the Micro Four Thirds format. This is a 7 to 14 millimeter. This is a Panasonic Lumix lens. Although it works in Olympus bodies and it becomes stabilized on those bodies. Again, multiplied by two, this becomes 14 to 28 millimeters. So that is an ultra wide angle zoom. And it has a constant aperture of F4. Now, if you're into really wide angle photography and you're using Micro Four Thirds, you have another option you could go for. In fact, there's a, there's a couple. Most notably, Olympus do a 12 millimeter uh, lens, which is really, really small. That's equivalent to 24 mil. Now, I was very tempted to bring that lens, but I wanted something wider still to get really big sky views, those big views of the gorges that I mentioned earlier, that when you've got this thing zoomed out, that's where it really comes into its own. So that's why I chose that lens. And this is working out really well. Reaching into his bag for the next one. It's right here, and I've got the, the lens hood mounted on this. You know you've got a serious camera when it's got a square lens hood. It always looks that bit better, doesn't it? This is another Leica lens. This is a 45mm f2.8. 45 times 2 becomes 90mm, so it's perfect for portraits. Also for short telephoto work, slight flattened perspective. Great for the sand dunes, I've found. Really, really good. And also photographing those little dung beetles as they run around. Um, this camera is also a superb macro lens. It does one-to-one -one reproduction. But there is another lens that you would be considering if you saw this. It's smaller, it's lighter, it's considerably cheaper, and it's optically brighter. And that's the Olympus 45mm f1.8. Now, if you're just into kind of portraits with a shallower depth of field, that is the lens to go for. But really, its closest focusing distance is not very impressive at all. And I've really got into doing some macro photography with this gear. So that's why I went for this Leica model. But again, so nice to have the choice, isn't it? You know, Sony NEX people, at the time I filmed this video in, in early 2012, they simply don't have that choice yet, at least if they want, to, want lenses in the native E-mount. Now, I've already explained why I've gone for these lenses in the first part of this video, but what I can tell you now is how they're working out in practice, having been using them for a couple of weeks on the road. One of the, the really nice things when you take a load of gear away with you is finding yourself using it all in equal proportions. There's nothing worse than if you want to travel light that you take something away with you and you, and you never use it. And I'm a bit like that with telephoto zooms. The thing that's really missing in this kit, the thing that is really crying out, is something equivalent to a 70 to 200 or a 70 to 300. But you know, I've not missed it at all. There was uh, an opportunity to photograph the sun rising this morning and sun setting tonight, very, very soon now. Um, apart from that, really, some of the sand dunes could have done with something a little bit tighter, but not much. I'm not really photographing any wildlife on this trip, so I don't really need that lens at all. Um, and the really reassuring thing is that I've actually used all of these four lenses equally. I haven't left one in the bag and, and gone, oh, you know what, that I didn't actually need that lens at all. And when you're constantly switching between them every day, that some people might consider that inconvenient, but that for me is a triumph. It means you've chosen the right gear. You brought the right gear along with you, so that, that's fantastic. Um, I've been really pleased with the quality of the results. I've actually tweaked the uh, the picture settings on this camera. I've uh, tweaked the noise reduction, turned that down a bit because when it's at its default zero setting, I find that it slightly smears uh, some of the finest details in order to avoid all noise speckles. Whereas I prefer to see a little bit of crispness. If, if there's noise that I don't want, I can just you know reduce it later in software. So I prefer doing that. I should also apologize that, that there's quite a lot of uh, wind noise at the moment so uh, I hope that's not sounding too bad which leads me neatly to another piece of equipment I'm using which is the zoom h2n I'm recording the audio with this microphone and I've been really pleased with the quality of that too so what I do is I take the video from the iPad the audio from the zoom h2n and I synchronize them in Adobe Premiere and edit that on a uh, Mac um, MacBook Air which is again an ultra portable device great for great for traveling in terms of the sort of physicality of the body, um, an environment like this actually makes you a little bit nervous because the sand is incredibly fine. It feels beautiful, but it's you know the ultimate enemy of cameras and electronic devices because it gets into all of those moving parts, and you know you're in big trouble. And some people I met 
when I was coming out here, they were showing me their pictures, and, and they were beautiful pictures, but there were little dots everywhere on them. And I thought, oh no, they've really, really ruined their cameras here. Um, hopefully they'll be able to get them cleaned. I was a little bit nervous about this because Panasonic don't state any specific environmental ceiling on this, and indeed not many, if, if any, of the, uh, the mirrorless compact system cameras sport what you'd call really confident weather sealing. And, and if you're going to be doing a lot of desert photography, you know, you really do want to take out a proper big DSLR that is sealed. But so far, touch wood, it's been fine. I've not done anything silly like change lenses when the breeze is up, uh, but so far, touch wood, it's been okay. The one mistake I did make, I'm not being completely, uh, you know, full of myself saying, oh, I made such fantastic choices, you know, I, I never make mistakes. I made tons of mistakes. One of the biggest mistakes I made with this is not bringing the optional electronic viewfinder. I remember I borrowed this from Panasonic New Zealand. Thank you very much, guys, for lending me this stuff. It's been absolutely great. And they said, do you want the viewfinder? And I was like, no, no, no. I was being really particular about getting my weight down. I mean, like this thing is big and heavy? Hardly. I should have just brought it with me. Instead, I didn't. And that has been a bit of a mistake because when the sun is shining on the screen in such an intense environment like this, it can be quite hard to see. So I should have brought that. I should have also brought a spare battery because I'm finding this battery runs out every, just about every day when you're shooting heavily. So I think I'll probably pick one of those up later on in the trip when I'm uh, in somewhere where I can actually get that sort of thing. But otherwise, I've been very pleased with this gear. And that brings me to the end of this video. Um, I hope I've given you a, a nice taste of Morocco, made you want to come and visit if you haven't already. Um, and also made you think also more about if you're traveling light to, to get a small camera. Maybe you, you would automatically reject one of these and just go for a normal traditional DSLR. But, you know, do think about compact system cameras because they may give you all of the quality and control that you need in a much more portable form factor. And for me, on that trip, that is a critical component. So thanks for watching. Once again, I'd love to hear your comments, whether you want to hear more or less about the travel, more or less about the equipment, or just get back to the reviews, Gordon. Stop going out and enjoying yourself. I'll try and do all of it, and we'll see if that's possible. And in my next video, I'll talk a bit more about whether it has been possible to do much work on the road. Thanks for watching. And as always, if you want more information, if you want to see any of the reviews that I've been publishing, you can find everything at cameralabs.com.